process is assess the people and be comfortable that, that they will put these things through in time. Elsewhere in Europe, um, the known risk, the defective title market, uh, has still got huge growth potential. Um, and in many countries, and especially in, in Central and Eastern Europe, the property systems and, and the laws at the back of them are still pretty sort of fresh. Um, Nobody is all that sure how difficult questions of company law, for example, would be resolved in a, a Hungarian court. Because some of those laws have not been there long enough to be te tested as thoroughly as, as they have here. Um, this makes lenders and investors a bit jumpy. Uh, could, could a shareholder, an agreed shareholder, come along and unwind the transaction? Or if you buy land from the municipality in these countries, the, the rules are, are pretty tortuous. Are you sure you've done everything right? Could somebody come along again and unwind that transaction? And especially where you've got risk of errors, pension fund money going to these countries, they want that sort of cover. So we, most of us, as we've seen there just now, is the effect of title market. As, as financial institutions grow, then I would expect to see a parallel growth in the good title market. And we're actually, we will promote the spread of certain sorts of financial institutions like residential <coughs> we will help those markets grow um, because that generates opportunities for us. So just, just to round up my bit, title insurance has got one main purpose, it's to make property related transactions happen more easily uh, and therefore more quickly and at lower cost. Um, on some occasions, as with the effective title business, uh, it can help to close transactions that would never have completed otherwise because you could never have resolved the uncertainties. From my point of view, I'm, I'm looking at think financial mechanisms, CMBS. Now that's growing faster in Europe than it ever did over a comparable time period in the US. Um, and it seems to me that it, it's maybe not going as quickly now as it was, but it's going to go on growing. I mentioned the, the, the $17 billion premium income and the fact that about 90% of that came from the US. To my mind, what that shows is that there's about a $15 billion opportunity in Europe uh, and, and we certainly want to try and take advantage of that. So that's the end of my bit, really. You're on. Start with that one. Can I ask you a quick question while you're still there? Sorry, good. Probably, probably both of you here. This yes. is, um, in terms of, we just talked about this very briefly anyway, was looking at the um, you know, CMBS or even the secondary mortgage market. What do you think, in terms of the Freddie and Fannie's, uh, Fannie Mae's, do you think that um, what proportion of the income currently comes from, uh, you know, comes from that, from, from the you know, requirement of, say, um, Fannie Mae wanting title insurance and needing title insurance? And, you know, if that's a significant portion, would you actually go out and try to encourage other people to create a secondary mortgage market here? I mean, would you actually sponsor it? Is it worth enough to you to do that? I think it's worth it from our end. I mean, it's, it's, it's a situation where the more readily <coughs> available the secondary mortgage market is, the cost of money is less, yeah. and, and you have a situation where now money is flowing from one lend an originator lender to you know, a mortgage buyer. And then now uh, you freed up more money to go into the economy. I mean, I, I think it's definitely worthwhile. And the secondary mortgage market is not only going to expand in Europe, it's going to expand in Latin America and a number of other economies where you least expect it to. I would agree with that. And, and I, think you can, I think it will become more important as things like Basel II uh, arrangements become um, more effective, if you like. <coughs> You're already seeing some lenders are being very innovative parceling up their loan books and moving them on in the UK. Northern Rock's a very good example. If you look at the way that they deal with uh, their loan books, they move them on very properly. They've actually used a, a very innovative approach uh, by buying insurance for the, the, what they call the first loss trough or, or a, a loan book. Um, so the, the dodgy mortgage, mortgages are going to default They've insured against the risk that the default rate will be worse than expected. So they've taken that out of the structure and that's rebalanced the whole thing. It's made it easier to sell the rest. Uh, and lenders like that are going to keep on doing that sort of thing. Um, one thing that I've had a couple of issues with recently, certainly on the Europe side, on the Eastern Europe side, is that um, 
rare due diligence report actually pulls out loan risk. Um, the legal departments of the banks insisted on the cover being on non lending risk cases. Um, is this something that you're on, on what basis? On an unknown risk basis. So they're actually asking for the wide cover just because they turned twitchy, because they found something. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, the, the way we deal with that is, when we started doing this business, we used a US style policy, and that was based on unknown risks, so it had a menu of risks. And we had to go through a rather convoluted business of saying, well, add an endorsement to cover the one that you're really worried about, and that's the one that will carry on. Now, what we've got now is, you've got a choice. We'll either give you it just for the risk that you've identified, or we'll give you it on a blanket basis. Now, in some jurisdictions, we're probably going to be more nervous than doing the latter, because there's more things that can go wrong. And I don't understand, I'm not really sure why a lender would insist on that. They just seem to be going twitchy, that's what I'm saying. It's, it's fact. Yeah. So um, my argument will always be, well, well Cover the risk you know. the risk, because that's what's actually yeah. pulling out here. That, that, the, the, the unknown risk cover is available. Yeah, but, but it's obviously far more expensive. Or, and, and you have to look at the structure okay. that, that, that what's more expensive point from the client's perspective. Sure. And you actually have to turn around and say, well, there's not much I can do about this because <coughs> the banks are actually insisting. I'm not if you're specifically training lawyers in, in Europe to insist on it. No, but it's still a bargain though compared to relative other types of insurance that you can get. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure the cost of insurance for this building. The property casualty is much, much more than what you would pay for a title premium on this bill. Yes. And you pay every year. Mm -hmm. Yes. But one of the differences we found, the market we inherited in the UK was that you gave the cover for the title problem that you were worried about, and it lasted forever. It went to every success. <coughs> that's actually not something we would wish to repeat. And, and, and title insurers don't typically offer that in the UK. They, they'll give you some continuation of cover, but they won't, they won't let it go on forever because it's just, it, it's commercially, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. It doesn't make a lot of commercial sense. So they know I really exist, I'll get in front of the camera. <laughs> uh, just to elaborate briefly on what my colleague said here earlier. The history of the secondary mortgage market in, say, in uh, the United States didn't really start to take off until after World War II, where you had a number of soldiers buying property under the GI Bill. Uh, traditionally, banks loaned money in areas that they were familiar with. So it was very uncommon for a bank to loan outside its county, outside its, sta outside its state, because they knew who the recorders were, they knew what the land registries were like, they had a high degree of comfort level. It would be rare that a bank in Missouri would loan for money for a house in California. And so when the title business came into fruition, I mean that's really where it started to blossom, is because they were looking for standardized practices that would make the industry uniform so that now you have lenders who can loan all over the country because the title policy that he would receive in Massachusetts would be somewhat similar to what he would receive in California. And as title companies started to take over, they started to take over really the means of production, not only in just accumulating data, but in setting up closings. In a bank in the United States, very seldom will you go for a closing. That's usually handled at a title office, an escrow office. Banks have really become nothing more than loan originators. And then they sell the mortgage someplace else. So the, the two types of policies that are offered in the United States are the lender's policy and the owner's policy. Of course, the lender's policy goes on for 100 years, as long as you own the property, if you can live that long. If it's a corporation, it goes on for the life of the corporation owns the property. But it expires or is terminated when you sell the property. However, the lender's policy will terminate when the loan has been paid, but it does not terminate when the loan is sold. So the same protection applies. So what does that mean if you have a portfolio in the States of 2,000 properties? Now you're, you've 